Welcome to the 2022 James Agee Online Reading Series hosted by Pellissippi State Community College. My name is Charles White and I am with the English Department. It's my pleasure to introduce James E. Cherry, a West Tennessee novelist and poet, and he'll be reading from his excellent literary thriller, Edge of the Wind. Thank you. Hey, Charles. Um, sorry I can't be uh, with you guys in person, but uh, I'll take the next best thing. Uh, thank you for having me as part of the James and uh, James Agee uh, Literary Festival. I don't think uh, you can write a better novel than uh, Death in the Family. And I'm honored to be a part of uh, a continuum of writers who have come before me. And uh, I know you have some great writers who will come after me. So anyway, uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm going to read from uh, the novel Edge of the Wind, uh, which has just been re-released. Uh, from um, Stephen F. Austin Press uh, is a forward by a guy named Charles Dodd White, uh, who's a pretty good writer in his own right. But I'm going to read the, uh, the first chapter and uh, a brief synopsis. The protagonist, uh, his name is Alexander Vanderpool, who was aspiring to be a poet. But he also uh, he's also dealing with some issues of schizophrenia and uh, one of the voices that he hears in his head is that of a character named Toby. So I will uh, read a bit from this. And if uh, time permits, I will uh, share a few of my poems from my collection of poetry, uh, Loose Change as well. Chapter one from Edge of the Wind. Alexander Vanderpool awoke like a man crawling out of a deep dark hole. He yawned, stretched, rubbed crust of sleep from his eyes and flipped off the radio that crackle with more static than jazz. The weather had changed since he'd been holed up in his sister's spare bedroom in Stovall, the middle of nowhere. Late September descended upon West Tennessee, blanketed it, blanketed it in shorter days, cooler temps. He knew that meant the frenzy of high school football, bright lights at the county fair, and fields woven with intricate designs of cotton. Alex knew this part of the country well and hated it. He was born and raised in Stovall and couldn't believe after all these years, he was now back where he started. He blinked twice and everything sharpened into focus. Four pair of pants clung to the back of a chair. Three short sleeve shirt, three short sleeve shirts draped a dresser. Several torn out pages from a legal pad haphazardly covered the bed. Books. Poetry, novels, textbooks were strewn across the bedroom floor as if nothing more than an afterthought. Some were dog-eared, others lay open on their bellies, and many were stacked one upon another, but all were the byproduct of his sister's four years at State College. In the last two months, Alex had read everything in the room, had reread Dickinson, Langston Hughes, Hemingway, and Steinbeck but he fell asleep with Richard Wright's native son across his chest. He groped like a blind man for the book beside him, and when he did, it thudded against the floor. Alex bolted upright, sat aside the bed, jerked his head around as if someone had called his name and he couldn't determine from which direction it came. He held native son like a rosary while his eyes settled on the photograph of himself, his sister and mother on the dresser. The image was as fresh as it was 17 years ago. He closed his eyes and savored memory as if it were a slice of deep, rich chocolate. He was nine years old, his sister Margaret, 14, and their mom between them with her arms draped around their shoulders. It was Saturday on an April afternoon and he was happy again. The three of them smiled as if Marshall Park was heaven and they had halos over their heads, happy. He and his sister ran for the swing set, used their legs to break the bonds of gravity and race toward the sun. Her legs were longer and stronger, and sometimes she sailed so high and wide, he thought that she would orbit the planet at any moment. The basketball court was another matter. What he lacked in height and length, he compensated for with speed and quickness. Alex faked left and drove right to get around Margaret and lay the ball off the backboard and through the net every time. Afterwards, his mother returned from their car, stretched a blanket across the green grass down by the lake, 
And the three of them bowed their heads and blessed the plate and blessed the picnic basket of fried chicken, potato salad, fruit, and slices of chocolate cake. They washed it down with cold bottles of orange soda and smacked their lips. His mother became recumbent against the earth, used an open book to shield her eyes from the sun. Margaret waved at a classmate, Elise, met her halfway to discuss Miss Suther Sutherland's English class and every bond who sat in the third row. Alex meandered by the lake, the late afternoon light warm and ethereal upon the water. He walked down a pier where kids his age used it as a diving board to splash in and out of the water, their laughter yellow and round as it bounced across the park. The wind rolled off the day like a bedtime lullaby. No amount of noise could drown out its sweet harmonies. He sat on the bank of the, of the lake, lingered in the peace he'd found there. When he walked back towards the, his mom, four ducks flapped their wings and waddled after him. Alex felt bad that he had nothing to offer them and they soon stopped, watched him stumble up a hill. When he reached his mother and sister, Elise had joined them and was holding his mother's camera. He still remembered the inflection in Elise's voice when she said, say cheese. His mother and sister were all he had and all he needed. Before he was nine, there was a father in the house. But when he left, Alex, his sister, and his mother stretched the fabric of their lives to cover the hole and make the pattern complete again. The only thing that possessed, the only thing that he possessed that belonged to his father was his last name in an old photograph. Most days he even managed to push those out of his mind. His sister and his mother were the only family he'd ever known and loved. It was as if he was born at nine years of age. Anything before that time was too painful to remember. Alex lay on his back with an open book across his chest, rolled his eyes towards the ceiling and watched his childhood in Stovall descend light upon him. He wasn't raised in the, in the rural part of the county, like where his sister lived now. They lived in the middle of Cartmel Street with a Baptist church on one end and Barry Court's housing project on the other. Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, his mom led him by the hand to the house of the Lord, where he attended Sunday school, sang in the youth choir, and was a junior usher. But Monday through Saturday, the streets tugged at his shirt sleeves. The fast tailed girls agreed to show him theirs if he showed them his. Fifty bucks was easy money just to look out for the police, and kids his age or younger were already drinking and carrying guns. When he was a teenager, the BCs ruled the block. And in order to walk that end of the street without getting a daily beat down, you had to pay a tax, join the gang. Alex was about to pay up one day when he was cornered by two of them after school. The one wearing an undershirt with a purple bandana tied around cornrows pinned his arms behind his back while the other dripping gold chains from his neck snarled a mouthful of invectives and gold teeth. He slapped Alex, took target practice on his navel with his fist. Alex doubled over, and when he looked up from his knees, his sister Margaret had high heel shoes in both hands and wailed away at everybody that didn't look like him. She invited them to join the Vanderpool gang as they scampered away, rubbing the knots on their head. She pulled Alex to his feet, admonished him for crying. Alex stayed away from that end of the street, and the gangbanger stayed away from his big sister who vowed that when she got older and when she got older, she was going to find her some land in the country where she wouldn't have to fight for the sake of fighting. A good pair of stilettos were too expensive to get repaired every other day, she said. She said. By his junior year in high school, Alex played in on the football team and caught two touchdowns against Farragut. After the game, he waited at the kitchen table for his mom to come home to share the news. She wheeled herself through the door and he didn't recognize her. She had aged 10 years since leaving home that morning. Her hair had grayed, lines formed around her eyes and, she, and her shoulders drooped from working as an elementary school secretary by day and cleaning offices at night. He rushed from his chair, helped her remove her coat and kissed her on the jaw. He wished her a good night and she replied that she loved him as she dragged herself to bed. The next day, Alice quit the football team and got a job bagging groceries 
after school at the Piggly Wiggly. He thought about quitting school altogether to work full time, but mom threatened to break his left leg and Margaret away at college, his right, if he did so. His senior year started great. Mom didn't have to scrub toilets anymore with the extra income coming into the house. And he had even saved enough money to buy a 1965 Mustang to restore one part at a time. He flirted with Melanie Henderson, a tall brown skinned girl who sat beside him in English class and, and wore sweaters as tight as her skirts were short. Between history and geometry class, they found a dark corner near his locker. And when Alex closed his eyes and his mouth met hers, he didn't know the tongue was capable of doing such things. The world spun around him and he was caught in its whirlwind and didn't want to be set free. When she pulled away and adjusted her hair, he stumbled to class like a drunk man. At 17, one Friday night, he left his virginity on her living room couch when her parents were away. But before Christmas break, everything his teachers were saying began to be drowned out by the voices he'd never heard before. They kept telling him that he wasn't shit and he wasn't going to be shit. Alex started talking back to them, telling them to shut up. But the voices became louder and more frequent, and so he began to accommodate them. He accused mom of poisoning his food, suspected Margaret of taking his money, and cursed classmates whom he swore were talking behind his back. Melanie, too. He found all the Vanderpools he could on the internet, and when he contacted them, asked if any were his dad. For a week after mom had gone to work, he stayed in his bedroom, staring blankly at the news channels. And when the TV and when the TV wasn't on, he laughed remotely at its black screen. He heard George W. Bush in the walls, and by the time he torn a hole in the paneling, Bush had escaped. He ran barefoot, shirtless down to Stovall High, burst into a math class, and declared that he was going to join Al, Al Qaeda in high definition on CNN. He and his family would soon know the meaning of schizophrenia. After two months of counseling, medi med medications, and electroconvulsive therapy at, at Lakeview, it was mid-March and too late to return to Stovall High. He earned a GED by June and went on a two-month job hunt. When his phone never rang a second, uh, when his phone never rang for a second interview, Alex enrolled in Stovall State that September. One of thirteen hours he took that. Of the 13 hours he took that semester, all he remembered was his 930 poetry workshop with Dr. Bobby Hamilton. The first week, Dr. Hamilton and the students excruciated him for his cultural references and mocked his style and technique. By the second week, his poetry was a punchline of their perverse sense of humor. As he gathered up his book bag, their mockery propelled him through the door and out of the school. Their laughter still echoed after all these years. In October, his cousin Raymond called from Memphis to wish him a happy 18th birthday, informed him that Miss South distributors were hiring and that a change of scenery may do him good. His mother agreed, and two weeks later, Alex moved with, and two weeks later, she moved to, she moved with Alex to keep an eye on her son. Two days afterwards, Alex living in two days afterwards, Alex was living and working in Memphis, Tennessee. Alex looked around the room once again, glanced at the ceiling. He couldn't believe after seven years he was back where he started. He couldn't fully explain what had happened or what went wrong. All he knew was that the walls of his sister's house were closing in upon him and that he was stuck in Stovall. And now the voices were back. This time it was Toby. The house creaked under its own weight. Alex slipped from the bed as if it were on fire and when he did, the copy of Nate's son thudded against the floor. Toby, Toby, that you? Yeah, man, you expecting somebody else? Toby's laughter echoed throughout Alex's head, died in a remote corner of his mind. Kind of cold this morning. Alex brushed his hair by running his fingers through it. He rose from the bed, flung open the curtains, and stood beneath a stream of soft morning light. He scratched his te testicles through blue boxer shorts. Cold. Man, you need to wake up on the south side of Chicago in the dead of winter like I did one time. It was so cold, I thought my balls were going to turn purple and fall off. 
Where I was staying, I spent most of my time between fighting that hawk and sidestepping rats. You ever kill a rodent, Vanderpool? He didn't give Alex opportunity to answer. I ain't talking about no mouse with no trap, Toby continued. I'm talking a rat the size of your hand with teeth as long as your arm is sharp enough to take a leg off of one bite. If you don't have a lead pipe or a baseball bat handy, you'll be walking with a limp the rest of your life. Feel like I've been killing rats all my life. Outside, three bluebirds lighted upon a tree and flew away. Their wings beat music upon the air, shadows across Alex's face. You ever kill anything, Vanderpool? Alex sighed. Alex sighed. The question reminded him of what day it was that he was supposed to be in court at nine o'clock. No, nah, they said I tried to, though. Who is they? Alex turned around expecting to see somebody, but no one was there. He walked over to the he walked over to the dresser, inspected himself in profile, and stared at the white bandage over his right eye. The Shelby County criminal justice system. DA tried DA tried to stick me with attempted second degree, but my lawyer got it down to a lesser charge. Lesser charge? Man, they done sent niggas to the electric chair on some lesser charges. What happened? Alex shook his head. What? I don't know. You better find out. You need a good lawyer? Look up Colin A. Pride, attorney at law. He told me one time, Toby, you stay out of the cemetery, I'll keep you out of the pen. Say, that DA name wasn't Wardell, was it? I don't know. What happened, Vanderpool? Alex whipped around. I don't know. His words were fist punching the wall. He stumbled over a copy of A Good Man is Hard to Find, then regained his balance and stood over the bed. A clock on the bedside table intruded upon his thoughts. Its red face glared at 8.30. In an hour, his parents would be here to take him to his court, appoint to his court appointment at noon in Memphis. I don't know what happened and I don't care. All I know, I, all I know is I finally know what I need to do with my life. Alex waited for the voice in his head as time balanced, began to float away. He heard nothing this time. He waved his arm over the length of the bed, his sweep encompassing the contents that lay upon it. Poetry, Alex said out loud, smile wide, smile wide and bright. He gathered a legal pad and a, and a handful of loose sheets of paper and held them over his head. I want to write poetry. Poetry? I don't even know what that is. I couldn't afford to mess with no poetry. But I can't afford not to. Alex rearranged several loose sheets of paper in his hand, shuffled them as though they were a deck of cards. This is the only thing that's kept me alive the last two months, Toby. Writing these poems, reading all these damn books. When I write, I'm not so agitated. Things are clear and I relate to other things clearer. When I write, I know where I've been and why I went there and how I got to this point. Now, if poetry can do that, who needs Sarah Quill? Poetry is just like having wings on my back, man. You can't fly with fiction. I could get into a good novel. Alex shook his head. Ain't no time for a novel, Toby. Things are moving too fast. Seem like the days are all out of order now. All I have is this moment in poetry is like sticking your finger in, it, in an electrical socket. I'm on fire. I can do anything. I just want the world to know I'm alive. I hope you have a better trip than I did. Check this out, Toby. Alex turned the sheet of paper right side up and began to read. Oh, great night, God of creation, son of the moon. Why are you daylight upon me down at the peak of shining? You look faint back so weak at me. Oh, great moon, and ever so I tip my place. It feels to be out to you, for I know how of hat. But oh, great temporary, these feelings are your place only, moon. For you'll find, as I'll find, my creator, for we are committed, we're made by the place, and we to him, his face thus be strengthened. We are glory destined to see, and by his. Oh, great forever, you will be moon in that moment of strong you, and give night and day in your ultimate light, and it shall be done when I'm made before his holy sight whole. Well, 
Don't laugh at me, Toby. That's the worst thing you can do to a person. I've been laughed at before about my poetry. That's not going to happen again. I ain't laughing, man. I don't know if it's good or bad. Who gets to judge? Alex nodded. I'm going to find out if it's good or bad. That's why I'm going to Stovall State today. I got all my papers in order this time. He held up a handful of poems for no one in particular. Ain't nobody or no thing going to stop me from taking that poetry class either. I want to see what Dr. Bobby Hamilton, he pronounced his name as if he swallowed a spoonful of castor oil, has to say this time. Toby cleared his throat. You sure you want to fool around with that school? Poetry is life or death now. It's, it's for real and it's forever. I should have done this several years back, but ran into a, but ran away from my calling. There's nowhere else to run now, Toby. It's the only thing that matters. If you feel this way about poetry, why you been talking to me for the last month? Why not Shakespeare or some goddamn body? Alex sat on the bed, dropped the papers beside him and laughed long and hard. When he finished, he lay back. When he finished, he lay back on the bed with his hands clasped behind his head. He was silent several minutes. You changed everything, Toby. You've given me the confidence to be whoever I want to be, to do whatever I want to do. Every day I wake up, I know you're going to be here to lead and guide me. All I got now is you and all these books. For the first time I was able to open a book, doesn't matter if it's poetry or fiction and define, and define myself, take a good look at the way I am. Until then, I thought no one understood me, that I was the only one feeling this way. There are others out there, hundreds of us. I tried to talk to some poets, but they were too busy trying to get paid for poetry readings. Besides, you the only one that ain't never cursed me out. Not yet, besides, I'm not who you think I am. What are you talking about? Who are you? I'm Toby. I'm, I'm just a voice in your head. And if, and if I'm in your head, that means I really don't exist unless, unless you allow me to. Then it's your own voice you are listening to anyway. Look, man, Alex heard Toby sigh. You can't live your life the way I do or the way anyone else has. Don't blame me if you screw it up and don't give me any credit if you get it right. I got enough problems. You and you alone got to decide who you want to be. I am Toby. Well, I'll be damned. It's like that, huh? How old are you, Vanderpool? 25. You sure you want to go down to that damn college and take a poetry class? Have you forgotten what happened last time? You know these white folks don't want you doing nothing like that. And if you don't do nothing else, you can always stay here. At least you got plenty to eat. Ain't sharing a room with four or five folk. I almost had a room of my own once. Alex sprang from the bed, stepped on a copy of 100 Years of Solitude. And do the fuck what? Whether I go or don't go to that college, the only thing I have is the only thing I have to lose is my life. He grabbed a book bag from the floor and stuffed it with poems, tossed it into a chair before walking into an adjacent bathroom. After he showered, Alex grabbed a pair of scissors, chopped handfuls of his hair, and dragged a razor across what remained until it piled around his feet. He massaged his scalp with lotion until it gleamed like a temple dome on the side of a mountain under a golden sun. Finally, he shaved his beard, meticulously trimmed his mustache, splashed cologne upon his face, and applied the odorant underarm. He ripped off the bandage and revealed a room and revealed a wound with stitches over his right eye. He measured his new look in the mirror, nodded in approval, tossed the bandage and hair trimmings in the wastebasket, then exited the bathroom. Upon re-entering the bedroom, Alex slipped on a book stopped to grab it and held it up to the light. The collected poems of Elizabeth, of the collected poems of Elizabeth Bishop. The fish, the fish, she let the fish go. Alex loved that poem and would always laugh aloud when he remembered it. He removed underwear, a white pullover shirt and black pants from a dresser drawer, slipped into them. Toby, he rambled the top drawer in quest, he rambled the top drawer in a quest for a fresh pair of socks, and when there were none, extracted a 38 revolver from beneath a stack of t-shirts. He released the cylinder to ensure that six bullets were in place, then, then zipped the weapon in his book bag. 
That's a good move, Vanderpool. Everybody else is walking around here with one. But why do you need to take one to college? No, I don't forget about what happened last time when I tried to get to get get in that portrait class over at that college. As far as I got was the administration building. They said I didn't have all my papers in order that I need to come back when I did. And when I tried to show them my poetry, they said I was acting strange and called the law on me. That sheriff, Alex fingered the scar above his right eye. That goddamn sheriff throwing me on the concrete and hitting me with his knife stick for no reason. I hope like hell I run into that son of a bitch again. Yes, I remember what happened last time, Toby, and so do you. But that was two weeks ago. They put me out that time. Ain't going to be no putting out this time. That kind of looks like the gun I used to have. Can I see it? You've already seen it. You got a knife? Alex pulled the laces of his brown shoes into a tight bow. He wasn't wearing socks when he stood to his feet. What do I need a knife for? You might run out of bullets. Besides, look like cutting the motherfucker's head off the day is a going thing. Alex grabbed his book bag, swung it over his shoulder, had his hand on the doorknob, then remembered what he'd forgotten. Allowing the book bag to slide to the floor, he grabbed a legal pad and pen from the bed and standing with one foot on Emily Dickerson and the other on Walt Whitman, executed a flurry of writing across the page. He signed his name, tore the page, tore the paper from the pad and folded it. He wrote Margaret's name on the outside of the paper and left it on the dresser. He scooped, he scooped up the book bag, opened the door and walked down the hall. Alex, mama will be here in 30 minutes. You ready? Alex ignored his sister's inquiry from behind the closed bedroom door. He made his way to the kitchen, flipped on the light, poured himself orange juice, and set the empty glass in the sink. He slid open the drawer of forks and spoons, removed the butcher knife instead, and zipped it in his book bag along with the pistol. He walked back towards his sister's bedroom, stood outside the door. Alex? Yes, sis, I'm ready. I'm just going to step outside and get some air, okay? He paused, anticipated her saying something, and when she didn't, he added, I love you, Margaret. There was silence from the other side of the door. Outside, Alex, don't go too far. They'll be here shortly. Is everything okay? She stammered. You all right, Alex? Alex opened the front door, paused on the threshold and looked back over his shoulder. Toby, this is it, you ready? I'll see you down the road, Vanderpool. Alex closed the door behind him, crumbled a crisp morning underfoot.